Good evening and uh, welcome to the Wednesday night Bible study here at Broadway Baptist Church. Daniel is traveling this week and he has asked me to offer our, our study this evening. So when he asked, he was, uh, he was fairly specific about what he'd ask us to turn our hearts to tonight. And what was most uh, pressing on his mind this evening uh, for, for our fellowship, for our congregation, was uh, the... Uh, the, the racial discord that seems to have gripped our nation uh, in, a, in a profound way yet again. And it's not to suggest that there's not uh, a, a continuous measure of racial discord, but it has, has hit a fevered pitch again in our nation. And Daniel has asked us to turn our hearts towards, towards that this evening. Um, I'll, I'll begin by saying that the, the more I spend time with Daniel, the more I listen to Daniel, the more I get to know Daniel. And, and even just a couple of weeks ago, downstairs in this building, watching him talk to, uh, to someone on the telephone, just watching his facial expression, Daniel truly loves people. And I, and I mean, truly, truly loves people. It's a hallmark of his character. And in a, uh, in a, in a holy way, it is, it is one of the things that I envy about him personally. And, and it's from that heart of just tr a true love for people that Daniel's asked us to focus in this direction tonight. And so to begin with, uh, um, the world would have us focus our attention on... Uh, uh, the racial discord in riots on the street, the discord in the public square, the, the challenges back and forth between the aisles of our, our legislative bodies, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the cultural, the civil, the, uh, uh, the classist, racist divides that, uh, that permeate our, uh, our culture right now. Um, but I'm not going to focus there. And I don't want you to be mad at the world because that's where they focus. It's the only tool they have. They don't have the, the means that a, a, a born-again child of God has, the, the Holy Spirit that interprets and drives and clarifies for us uh, what is at the core of that which ails us. So they're doing the best they can with what they have. And this is why the church, it is so important for the church to step forward and provide leadership. And it is also inversely why so much has failed so miserably where the church has not vested into uh, the, uh, this, and I, I, I hate to use the word pandemic, or I just use the word plague, this plague of, of devaluation of another human being. So to begin that, um, uh, you are called still to live in this world that is plagued with this racial discord, this cultural discord, uh, but not of it. And the testimony of our hearts is that we have been transformed by the Holy Spirit to live in but not of and to minister to the, the disfigurement that this world has devolved into. Uh, so I, uh, I wanna maybe frame, there's a couple of frames that I wanna put on this evening. Uh, the first one, uh, Although all four Gospels will approach this, the Gospel of, uh, of John is the account that, uh, that I seem to remember the best. And it, it focused with uh, Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, uh, 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 Jesus presided over the last of the three Passovers that he would preside over. And then uh, with a prayer, Jesus and 11 of the disciples left the upper room and they were headed to uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, at the Garden of Gethsemane, when they reached the garden, three, Peter, James, and John, went in. The remainder of them stayed at the garden gate. Jesus placed the three under a tree, went to pray, came back, chastised them for, for falling asleep. And then the authorities came. The authorities came to arrest uh, Jesus. And uh, Peter wouldn't have it. You, this is a familiar piece of history to you. Peter wouldn't have it. And Peter drew a sword, cuts the ear off of Malchus, and Jesus heals miraculously Malchus and then turns his attention to Peter and he says Peter put away the sword put away the sword because those who live by the sword die by the sword 
Now, that's a familiar uh, 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 quote from Jesus. That's a familiar piece of history to us. And at least in my experience, it's also been reduced to a cliche in how it gets used so many times in so many wrong ways. And I don't want us to miss what Jesus is telling Peter. And because it, it's critically important. What Peter doesn't know is, is that, Peter, this is a battle of the spirit. What's happening here? Why we are in this garden, why I was praying, why you fell asleep under that tree, why this, 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 this band of so-called authorities come with clubs and torches in the middle of the evening to arrest me when they could have had me at any time in the public square. So this is a battle of the spirit. But Peter, you have drawn a weapon of men. You've drawn the wrong weapon, Peter. You have drawn a weapon of men to fight a battle of the spirit and you've already lost. You've already lost this battle. Put it up, Peter. It'll do you no good. Now, I mention that because we as the church have to recognize that the discord we face right now is a spiritual battle. This is not a battle of flesh and blood. This is a battle of the spirit. And if we do not recognize the nature of the battle that we are in, we will never be victorious in this battle. And if we, do, if we draw the wrong tools to heal, we will never win. So I'm going to ask you tonight to focus with me. I have absolutely no intentions of of talking about racism and classism and caste and all the isms and schisms that divide us this evening. Uh, my focus is going to be on the heart of a man that leads us to live our lives with all of these fractured, disfigured divides between us. Because the answer to racism is, is not found at the level of protests in the streets. The answer is found in the heart of one man at a time. And that's what I'm going to approach tonight. So as we get started, uh, um, uh, if, if, you're, if you're a fan of Thoreau, Thoreau wrote in Walden's Pond that for every thousand hacking at the branches of a problem, there's one hacking at a root. And I'm going to ask each of us to be that one that's hacking at the root of where we are at right now. If you'll forgive me for a moment, uh, I'm not inclined to necessarily cite myself, but uh, I have uh, uh, ongoing conversations with brothers, uh, either in, both in by person and by email. And I, uh, in a conversation just this week, uh, in a return letter to uh, a friend, uh, I want to I just offer, not in the exact same context that we were talking, but an applied context for this evening, uh, a thought from that letter. It's short. It's a double-edged sword we have. Jesus was clear. In this world, you'll have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. And when I return, and then again, Jesus said, when I return, will I find any faith? That faith would be scarce if present at all upon his return. This is a known fact in our lives, yet it should not deter any of us from serving with our whole heart and encouragement of the Lord in all the days of our lives. This is not a sweet by and by or a manufactured piety gemmed up in a motive cauldron of religion. It's a hard truth. The world is a very efficient machine. It produces exactly what it is crafted to produce. If only the church, if only the Christian would honor his craft as faithfully as the world honors its. What we face is the product of the world's craft every day. We, at, the, at odds with the, 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 cre the creator of this world is the craft of men and the creation of the ways and means of the world that leads us to this discord that we live in, that robs us of the peace that God invests in our lives. But the world, again, is just doing what the world is designed to do, what the world has crafted for itself. But we are not crafted of the world. We have been reborn. We have been made new. We've been given new eyes to see and new ears to hear. And we are held accountable by God to live that life in accountability to him as we live in the disfigurement 
and the disfigurement of how we look at each other when we turn to our right and to our left. I'm going to ask you a couple of times tonight. Take a look to your right. Take a look to your left. Imagine yourself in the public square, in a crowd. Look to your right and look to your left. In the crowd of people, can you identify one person who was not crafted by God? One person for whom which God did not send his son to die for. For which the, the shed blood of Jesus is not efficacious for the purpose of salvation. Look to your right and look to your left. Do you see any? So as, a, as, a, as, as the second of the frameworks that I wanted to give us tonight. In the early 1800s, a gentleman by the name of Junius Pierpont fathered a son by the name of John Pierpont Morgan. Uh, Junius Morgan, I'm sorry, Junius Morgan. Fathered a son by the name of John Pierpont Morgan. Jer John Pierpont Morgan grew and was later better known as J.P. Morgan, uh, one of the great industrial bankers in America. When John was just, uh, just a little boy, Pierpont, as his father would call him, uh, his father called him into his, his uh, office in their, their huge Hartford, Connecticut estate residence. And he sat him down at a desk and he went to a safe. He pulled $1 million worth of, of American currency out and he placed it on the desk in front of young John. And he says, John, that's a million dollars. Would you like a million dollars? John was impressed and uh, certainly he did desire that wealth. And Junius swept the money off of the table and he said, that's my million. Now you go earn your million. He says, hear me, Pierpont. You will never understand the value of a million dollars until you understand the value of one dollar. J.P. Would, would account later in his life, in his writings, that that was the catalyst. That was the, the seminal moment that drove him to become the great titan that he became. I don't want us to miss, though, the, the, the rest of of Junius's life. Junius, the testament of Junius's life was that he fully understood the value of a dollar, but he never understood the value of the man in which that dollar was held. For the rest of his life, he was a, a, a bitter, hard, driving man who never gave his son even the slightest encouragement or support. The, the value of a man, the, or the value of a dollar, is, it, it teaches the value of a million dollars. In the same way that the value of one man teaches the value of the human race. We will never be able to love the human race until we're able to love one man. Truly love one man. And it is, is, it is there where I want to focus our time tonight. Now, the culture will have us value, value uh, each other in uh, your capacity to fight, your capacity to defend, your uh, prowess on a, an, an athletic field, or your ability on a basketball court, your ability to sing or perform in a film or, or on, on stage, uh, there are, uh, your intellect. Uh, you'll be valued by your, your intellect. The, the, the ways and means of men have a myriad of ways to establish value on people and devalue people. And heroes are pedestalized just as quickly as they are knocked off of those pedestals. Valued and then devalued at the, at the whimsical nature of whatever is passionately uh, excited, uh, excited by us at the time. Um, so... I'm going to ask the, the, uh, the, the question that, under, that undercuts that. And what is the true value of a man? And I'm not going to ask you to ask that question tonight. I'm going to ask you to answer that question tonight. And I want to focus this evening on the answering the question, what is God's value of a man? Because that is what he calls us to value. He is calling us to see the world as he sees the world, value what he values, call sacred what he calls sacred, call profane what he calls profane. So I want to put two anchors on the table for us, two anchors. The first is the anchor of our craft. And for that, we want to turn to Genesis, specifically Genesis uh, 
Oh gosh. Uh, yeah, Genesis uh, um, 127. It's familiar language to us. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. It's a fundamental non-negotiable in our lives. Again, look to your right and look to your left. Put that vision back on your head for again. Who? Point out, identify. Identify who you see that was not made by God and thereby not made in the likeness and image of God. Not valued by God. Not, that, that does not have the Spirit of God breathed into their lives. Identify that person. If you can, I'll, in a kind of a, an ecclesiastical way, I'll, I'll let you know you can't. It, it, that person doesn't exist. To your right and to your left, the only thing that you will see are people crafted in the likeness and image of God. And for whom which the shed blood of Christ has been given for the purpose of their salvation if they will receive him. That's all you see. You see nothing other than that. It's a, non, it's a non-negotiable. It's a non-negotiable in our lives. That guard jealously that anchor in your life. Defend that anchor in your life. All human beings have an essential worth that comes from the, the craft of his making by God. It is not because of what he has done. He hasn't done anything. It's not because of who he is. He's nobody yet. It's not because of any uh, good things or bad things that are being weighed out on a scale. That God created us in his likeness and image and loved us before any of that happened. So the first non-negotiable anchor that I want to put on the table for us tonight. As we think about how, what the value of a man is. Is our craft. The second non-negotiable angle, equally as important, is our brotherhood. And for this, I want to turn to Genesis 4.9. It's, this is all still early in the self-revelation of God. This is also going to be familiar language to you. Um, there are two brothers. This, this is a familiar piece of history to you. There are two brothers, uh, Cain and Abel. Um, uh, Abel was a herdsman. And Cain was a, was a farmer. Abel made his way in the world by uh, uh, animal husbandry, raising livestock. And Cain made his way in the world by, by nurturing the soil and, and, and planting and growing and harvesting. And God required the boys to bring sacrifice. Uh, Abel brought an animal sacrifice before the Lord. Cain brought a grain sacrifice before the Lord. And the Lord accepted Abel's sacrifice, but not, did not accept Cain's sacrifice. Cain became jealous, and in a field he killed his brother. God called Cain account to account for this. And I want to I slow down here a little bit in the, in the narrative of this piece of history. God called Cain accountable for this. And the, the, the picture that we are given here of the recorded history of what took place there can't be overlooked this evening. And, and I want you to personalize it with me for a minute. I have two sons. You have children, I'm sure. Uh, one of my sons became jealous of the other and killed my other son. Uh, I found out about this and I called my son to account. Now, I want you to hear this exchange between God and Cain when he approaches Cain. He says, Cain, where is your brother Abel? This is, as an aside, this is the second time that God asked a question from the beginning of Genesis 1.1. This is the second question God asked. Uh, God doesn't ask questions for the purpose of finding out information he doesn't have. He asks questions for the purpose of telling you something about you that you don't already know. Where is your brother Cain? Cain's response 
could not be more callous, could not be more offensive, could not be more profane. And again, I'm asking you to personalize this right now with your own children and hear the response of one child who killed the other child. What? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? How callous. How indescribably callous. How, how vulgar a response. From God's position, it, God responds back. It's, a, it's another question right away. God says, what have you done? Now, God knows what he's done. The blood of, 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 Cain, of Abel cries out from the soil. The problem is, is Cain doesn't know what he's done. The problem is, is that, that then you, you, you hear this from God's perspective. When, you, when, when God says, Cain, what have you done? Because you don't know what you've done. He said, that was my child. I created him. I formed him in his mother's womb. I breathed life into him. The deposit of me is in him. I made him in likeness, in, in my likeness and image. I valued him highly. I valued him as I value myself. He's made in my likeness and image. And now you've taken his life. You've killed him. And you so, are so callous that you would respond to me with the question, am I my brother's keeper? In, in, in many respects, you would, you, you would think, well, uh, maybe, how did he know? How did he, how did he know that the, the killing things was, was that big of a deal? This was before the law, before Moses, before uh, uh, the, the tribes, before Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Christ, uh, before all of this, this re self-revelation of God that we are blessed with. This is in the earliest self-revelation of God to his created order and specifically to the highest part of his created order, human beings. And he's holding Cain accountable for killing his brother. Now, in many respects, we might consider that, that well, it's a life for a life. Abel dies, Cain dies. And the, the history, the record of this history goes on to say that here's the deal, Cain. From henceforth, the ground will be cursed. It will not produce for you. No matter where you go, what ground you touch, that ground will never produce for you again, and you'll be cast out. Cain's concerned for himself. But if you send me out, people will find me and kill me. No, I'll put a mark on them. Hear what God is saying. Oh, death? No, 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 no. I don't want you to die. I don't want this to end here. I want you to live. But here's the way you're going to live. Cain was a farmer. Cain nurtured food from the ground. That's how he made his way in the world. That's how he provided for himself. And that has been taken away from him. Cain is going to live, but live, and, and don't miss this, kept by another. What was your question, Cain? Am I my brother's keeper? You're not going to die for this. You're going to live for this. And every day for the rest of your life, you're going to live answering your own question. Yes, I am my brother's keeper because the only way I live now is to be kept by another. The very testament of his life for the rest of his life is going to be the answer to that callous, cold, dismissive, profane question he asked God. Am I my brother's keeper? We are our brother's keeper. It's a non-negotiable. There's no, there's, there's, we're not permitted to filter this through the value system that we may have adopted for our own lives. This meta-ethic that we have chosen and built and, 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 and guard so jealously in our lives. Um, this, is, this is a non-negotiable. You're not permitted to, to reshape this or redefine this. We are made in the likeness and image of our God, and we are our brother's keeper. These are two, the two foundational stones that anchor our time this evening. So what is the value of a man? It's certainly not the value that, 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 
that the world places on man because the, what the value the world places on man is, is self-consumptive. It's ravenously self-consumptive. We devour, we use and abuse each other on every front in little things by the snippy way we talk to each other to the big things by, by heartlessly killing innocent people. It is at the core of our wars. It is the core of the discord that it plagues our streets right now. So I want to ask again for us to focus on what is God's standard? What is, how does God, when God looks at his creation, what does he see and what does he call us to see? So the first one I want to focus on is the standard of a man before God. And the standard of a man before God, I'd like us to look at Micah 6, 8. Again, maybe this is familiar uh, uh, language to you. Uh, this is, uh, it, it's certainly Anchorage language for, uh, for me. And if I can actually turn there. Forgive me. There we are. Micah 6, 8 reads, What does the Lord require of you, O man? To act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. The, the question is asked for us. We don't even have to ask the question. It's already asked for us. How many times have, have, have maybe we ask, if we're, if we're honest about our walk, what does God really want from me? What, 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 what is my purpose? What, what am, I'm, I'm, I'm born again. For what? What is my purpose? What's God calling me to do? The, 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 the question is asked for us and the answer is given to us. What does the Lord require of you, O man? To act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. In the big picture, let's start in the big picture here. Act justly and love mercy. These are lateral relationship commandments from God. To act justly. To love mercy. And then the last one is to walk humbly with God. That's our vertical relationship. It is the anchor from which we Build our lateral relationships to act justly. Yeah, I don't know. In, in, it, uh, justice is, seems to be uh, maybe a little malleable culture to culture. Uh, as uh, Ravi Zacharias once cited, um, in some cultures, it's good to ask your neighbors over for dinner. In other cultures, it's good to ask your neighbors over as dinner. Which do you prefer? Do you see the distinction? That, that to begin with this command, to act justly, must mean that there is an absolute justness. Now, make the distinction. There's justness and justice. The justness is the absolute authority of God. The absolute measure of the sacred and the profane, the right and the wrong. And we are blessed to know that there is an absolute there is an absolute right. There is an absolute wrong. There is a justness to be known, to be acquired by, to be grabbed. And that, that if we don't know that, if that's not anchored in us, that we will never be able to act justly. We will always be on a, 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 a again, a meta ethic, an ever changing ethic for which justice becomes whatever I need it to be that suits me best at a time. Act justly. Know that there is a justness in, our, in the world to live by. Aspire to the justness of God. Love mercy. Forgive. Of all things, forgive. You have been get forgiven freely. Forgive those who have ought against you. When you look to your right, look to your left. All you see are people made in the likeness and image of God for whom which Christ died. Forgive. Allow room in, in, the, in the softened heart of the spirit-led Christian for forgiveness. And forgiveness and forgiveness again. Love mercy. It's not just have mercy, but love mercy. Let mercy be formative in your, in your, in your heart. That it is the default reaction. It's not the begrudging discipline reaction, but it's the default reaction. Love mercy. And then walk humbly with your God. Of all things, know that the highest governing authority in your life is not you. I know that the world will tell you this. It's, it's what we gravitate, gravitate to. The highest governing authority in my life, that's first and foremost, what I am saved from is not hell. What I'm saved from is me. 
myself, my own passions, my own uh, desire to drive my own life. I have to be broken of that. You have to be broken of that. You have to recognize that there is a highest governing authority in your life and it's not you. The highest governing authority in your life is the person of God, the will of God, the, the salvation of Christ, the presence of the Holy Spirit within us. Walk humbly in the Lord. Secondly, what is the order of a man before God? For that, we'll go to Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. It's a, again, these should not be unfamiliar passages to you. What is the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law of the prophets hang on these two commandments. They're side by side, indistance, indis, indistinguishable in their significance in the formation of a born-again believer. The greatest commandment of God is first to love him, to know him, to love him, to walk in his will. Uh, uh, John writes in his first epistle that we know we love him when we obey his commands, when we honor his will to first love God. It's the only thing that will equip you to love your neighbor as yourself. And second is love your neighbor as yourself. Look at how it's anchored. It's anchored in you. You're very, very capable of defining self-love. We all get it. We all love ourselves. We're all, we all desire we all, uh, to, to, to feed our own passions. We all uh, are enamored with our own press. We all are, are wrapped up in this egocentric world that is all wrapped around us. And we must be broken of that. That we must turn to our right and turn to our left and see people made in the likeness and image of God for whom which Christ died. Not the isms and the schisms the race distinctions, the cultural distinctions, the national distinctions, that, that's all created by man. That's not, that's not the will of God. The will of God is to see human beings crafted in his likeness and image. The order of a man before God is to love your neighbor. Love him like you love yourself. And there's the accountability of man before God. This is also in Matthew. Again, familiar scripture. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Matthew 5 is a, is a it, it, especially the first part of Matthew 5, is, is, is absolutely a, 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 just a, a, a hugely impactful passage of, of Scripture that, is, um, that gets in our business, that gets underneath our skin. Therefore, if you have an offering or a gift, leave your gift at the altar and remember... I'm sorry, therefore, if you have an offering, your gift at the altar, remember, and you, then you remember your brother or your sister has something against you, leave your gift there at the altar. First, go and reconcile with them and then come back to do your gift. Do the hard work. There is no way, and th this is, I, 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 this just surfaced, so I don't, I don't have the, 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 the scriptural reference for it, but do not come to me and tell me that you love me, whom you have not seen. If first you cannot love your brother whom you have. The, the, the passage calls us to account as a liar. If we are willing to say that we love God, but are not willing to say that we love our neighbor. Who's my neighbor? Let's not go down that street. Jesus already addressed that. Look to your right, look to your left. Do you see anybody? Anybody not made in the likeness and image of God? Do you see anybody for whom which Christ did not offer his sacrificial atoning life for? Do not tell me that you love me when you have ought against your brother. Don't come to me with your offerings that are supposed to respect me if you can't respect one that I made in my likeness and image. That I value so highly. What you're doing. What it, fundamentally what it is. Is contempt. You hold. What I value so highly. With contempt. If you have what. If you hate your brother. You hate your sister. You see with your own eyes. Not mine. You hold me in contempt. When you hate what I made. 
so precious to me. He or she to your right or to your left. Don't hold on. Forgive. Don't come to me with your offering until you are willing to forgive. Until you are willing to live at peace with your brother and your sister. It's vanity. Then there's the compassion of man before God. And in this, we're going to turn back to, to the book of Jonah. Jonah 4.11. It's the last sentence of the last chapter of the book of Jonah. Uh, whenever I talk to someone about reading the book of Jonah, I always tell them, read the last sentence of the last chapter first. It frames the entire historical account. If you don't understand the last verse of the last chapter, you don't understand the rest of what you will read in this book, in this historical account. It's not about a fish. It's not about the Ninevites. It's not about a weed. It's not about being swallowed by a whale. It's about the person of Jonah. And that last verse in that last chapter, Jonah is complaining. Yeah, I know. They did what you said. They repented. They turned. But they're still Ninevites. And I'm bitter. I'm bitter that you did not destroy them. God approaches Jonah and he says, but Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right from their left and many cattle as well. Should I not have compassion on that great city? The book, the, the historical account ends with a question. It's another one of the questions of God. We, we, it, it, it's worth a whole evening to go into that question, which we won't right now. But the, it ends open-ended. It ends with a question. Look, Jonah. There's 120,000 people down there who don't even have the presence of mind. Who don't have the, 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 the vision to even know their right from their left. These are people that are imploding on the, the consumption of themselves in their lostness. Are you really prepared to say to me, kill them they've repented should I not have compassion on them that question is turned upon Jonah it's the question that every one of us should be asking look at the lost and dying world they're just doing what the world does we can't be angry with the world for being the world we should be holding ourselves accountable for not investing into the world we cannot be Jonah's sitting on a hill beneath a withered weed that was providing him the menial comfort of a little bit of shade in the, in the hot, arid Middle Eastern sun and say, I don't care. I don't care that they were created in your likeness and image. I don't care that, 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 that Jesus' blood was shed to save them. I don't care that you value them. I don't care to look through your eyes at them. They're Ninevites. They're the world. The compassion of a man before God is that we must see the lost world as God sees the lost world. With a heart to serve the lost world where it is. It's not an option. To, to dishonor God in this manner is to dishonor the value of the salvation that he has built in your life. Remember, he saved you first and foremost from you. He has called you into his kingdom to serve in his kingdom. We must have compassion before the Lord. The compassion of a man before God. It's a couple more. The value of a man before God. This, we're, we're back to Matthew 5. Matthew 5 is, is, is an extraordinary uh, passage loaded. It, 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 would, it would take much, much longer to, 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 to really begin to digest this. But the value of a man before God. You have heard it said to the people long ago that you should not murder. Anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Anyone who's just angry 
with another human being is going to be subject to judgment. But listen to this. Again, anyone who says brother or sister, raka, is answerable to the courts. But anyone who says to a brother or sister, you fool, is in danger of the fires of hell. This is a, this is a, this is a, uh, 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 this is, Jesus, uh, he gets in our face here. He gets under our skin here. He peels back all of the, all of the, 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 the surface self-excuses that we have for why we feel the way we do. And, and if, if we're, if the, the hard truth of unveiled honesty is the way we feel about another person made in his likeness and image is irrelevant compared to what he sees in another person made in a likeness and image. It is bad enough that you might curse a man saying Raka. But when you undermine the dignity of a man, that's when you're in danger of the fires of hell. That's the value, that's the level of value that God places on an individual human being. We don't get there by ourselves. We don't, we don't just uh, magnanimously uh, uh, what's it, evolve into this age of Aquarius where, where can't we all just get along world? We, we don't naturally look at a brother or a sister to our right and to our left. We don't just naturally look to, uh, at each other and, and love. That is a discipline that God instilled in us in our creation that we fell from and is being rebuilt in us by the nature of our salvation. And if we hold, again, one of God's people, one of God's children in contempt, we hold God in contempt. For that person was made in his likeness and image, cast from his own nature, breathed into with a spirit that he is redeeming in his time in their lives. And to dishonor that is to dishonor God. We're, cl we're getting close to the end here. The dignity of a man before God. And, and I've saved this one for last. Because this does cut uh, at, at, near the bone here. Proverbs eighteen fourteen. Oh, wrong way. Proverbs 18, 14. The spirit of a man will sustain him in sickness, but who can bear the broken spirit? There's a proverb. If, you, if, you, if, you, if you're willing to, to, to let that immersively soak in, if you're willing to uh, uh, allow that to, to, to mull for a little bit on, on your heart, you should hear that even in sickness, even when the frame is weakened by this, 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 this virus that, is, that, that seems to be going around uh, from uh, uh, age and battle, injury, whatever it is that, that the frame of a man is, is, is broken, is ill, his spirit will sustain him. His will to live, his love of life. But if you take that away from him, if you, if, if you degrade a man to such a degree that you break his spirit, you've robbed him. Who can sustain that? Who can, who can, who can stand when there's nothing to stand for? Who can stand when all value of existence has been taken? Who can stand when the heart is crushed at its very core. This is what we do to each other every single day, big ways and in little ways. Throughout history, the, the, the horrible atrocities of one man's ought against another. And, and, and we don't have to, to enumerate them. We don't have to, to illuminate them. The, it, the, 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 the discord between men, the devaluation of man, has, the, the world has been filled with it from the moment Cain killed his brother. That the dignity of a man before God 
is given to him by God. And if you rob him of that, you have robbed him of that, that precious gift that God gave him. We must look at each other. Look to your right. Look to your left. What do you see? Men and women made in the likeness and image of God. Valued by God in a way that he calls you to value them. And that dignity, that essential value of life is given to them by God. I want to close now with a, with a kind of a brief illustration. Uh, as I prepared this week for, uh, for tonight, uh, my wife Gail uh, and I had a conversation about a, about a film that we had seen. We hadn't seen it in a while and I, I forgot exactly what, uh, 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 what inspired the conversation. 2011, uh, a film was released called The Help. It was developed from a, uh, a book by the same title, The Help. And, uh, and in the narrative of the book, the, the, the storyline takes place in the kind of the high-styled early 60s of, uh, of, um, of uh, the Deep South in, in Jackson, Mississippi. And um, uh, these, these young, affluent, upper-middle-income families uh, as, they, as they lived in, in this culture of the South in the, in the early 60s. And it was fashionable at that time to, to, ha uh, to hire uh, maids and drivers and cooks and, and nannies and housekeepers uh, for these, these young, um, um, uh, wealthy families. And uh, in one of these families, uh, the nanny was a, was a, a woman by the name of Abilene. Abilene was a, was a large woman, the broad lap which she valued because she was a nanny and she felt that, that all children should be reared in love on a broad lap. She had these large hands and, and this family had a, a, a daughter, a little Mae Mobley. Little Mae Mobley was about a three-year-old little girl and, and when Abilene laid little Mae Mobley down at night, when she brought, got her up in the morning, when she laid her down for a nap, when she got her up for a nap. Every time little Mae Mobley was to rest or to rise, Abilene would take little Mae Mobley and put her on a broad lap, and cup those little, those little cheeks of that little girl in her, in, her, in her face and say, you was kind, you was good, you was important, you was smart. And you were loved by God. The whole film is worth, the whole book is worth reading those lines, hearing them. Now, surely it was an act of kindness of a nanny to a, 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 um, a ward. But I don't want you to miss what was happening there. Abilene was making an investment into the next generation. Abilene looked at that little girl and gave her encouragement and love and guided her. It was, it was the only voice like that in her life. And though Abilene would never realize the fruit of the gift that she was giving to this little girl, this little girl would grow up knowing that the person who valued her most, the person who loved her, the person who took the time to tell her that you was kind and you was good and you was smart and you were loved by God was a person of a very different color skin who comes from a very different place, who lives a very different life and who is treated poorly by others. But that's the one. That's the one that would invest in little Mae Mobley's life. I'm asking you tonight to be a little bit more like Abilene. Make that effort to invest in the next generation. That this, is, this battle is not fought in our legislative halls. It is not fought in, in policy or procedure. It is not fought by, by angry mobs and in in, in large demonstrations. These are, these are causes. But these do not cut at the heart of a man or a woman who holds such ought against his neighbor, against his brother, but most specifically against one created in the likeness and image of God, just as you were, with a spirit breathed into him by the same God that breathed the spirit into you, and whose soul hangs in the balance every day on the shed blood of Christ, shed for them in the same way it was shed for you.
we're not going to close this evening. The, the word racism has hardly been used here tonight. I don't want to, I don't want to focus on racism. I want to focus on the heart beneath it. That question gets answered by itself. Once we begin to see the world as God sees the world, once we begin to value each other the way God values. Father, acquire us. Let us not just learn, but let us understand and perceive. Let us not add your word to our lives, but by the Holy Spirit be transformed by your word. Acquire us, Father, by your word. Acquire us for your kingdom. Lead us to see the world as you see the world. Value what you value. Love what you love. Call sacred what you call sacred. Call profane what you call profane. And when we look to our right and we look to our left, in spite of what the world has shaped us by, lead us to see what you see a brother and a sister, one created in your likeness and image, in dignity, in love, with a spirit to be honored and guard us from ever breaking a man's spirit, from breaking a heart. Father, we, we thank you that wisdom is to be known, that there is wisdom and that wisdom can be known. And that you have seen fit to, to reveal wisdom to us. Let us be acquired by that wisdom. Not add it to our lives. And let us live. Guide us to live. Empower us to live. And forgive in your will. And forgive us when we fail. It's in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen.